In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty God, our eternal refuge and strength, grant unto us your blessing in this hour. Lift our vision beyond the shadows of this world and help us to see the light of eternity that our spirits may grow calm and our hearts may be comforted. Through Jesus Christ our Lord,
beloved, we are gathered here today to pay our final tribute of respect to that which was mortal of our deceased loved one and friend. To you members of the family who mourn your loss, we especially offer our deep and sincere sympathy. May we share with you the comfort afforded by God's word for such a time as this. Psalms 46. God is our refuge and strength, a tested help in times of trouble. And so we need not fear, even if the world blows up and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble. There is a river of joy flowing through the city of our God, the sacred home of the God above all gods. God himself is living in that city. Therefore, it stands unmoved despite the turmoil everywhere. He will not delay his help. John 14, verses 1 and 2. Let not your heart be troubled. You are trusting God. Now trust in me. There are many homes up there where my father lives, and I'm going to prepare them for your coming. When everything is ready, then I will come and get you, so that you can always be with me forever where I am. If this weren't so, I would tell you plainly. John 14, 15 through 19. If you love me, obey me, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter, and he will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit who leads all into truth. The world at large cannot receive him, for it isn't looking for him doesn't recognize him, but you do, for he lives with you now, and someday will be in you. No, I will not abandon you or leave you as orphans in the storm. I will come to you. In just a little while, I will be gone from the world, but I will still be present with you, for I will live again with you, and you will too. Let's pray. Father God, we want to thank you for your mercy. We want to thank you for your grace. We want to thank you for the gift that you gave us in your son, Jesus Christ. We want to thank you for all of the incredible things that you've done for us. And we want to thank you for the hope that only you can give. We want to thank you for your, the incredible sacrifice that you made for our sins so that this world isn't the end, so that we have that hope and we get to be with you again. We just love you and praise you and consider it an honor to be able to serve you. For we ask all these things in the powerful, unchanging name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. say thank you uh, first of all for the church allowing us to have the services here this was a place that was very dear to my mom's heart she uh, bonded very well with the people here and she told me and her last wish is if it could be worked out she would love to have a service here but she gave me a stipulation she said you have to bring the message and she said there has to be an invitation to accept Christ. Yeah. She says, those are the two things that I want to have happen at my funeral. And I said, well, Mom, I said, uh, I don't know how many times I've been up in front of a group of people at a funeral and my emotions are going one way, my brain is going another, and my spirit in another. So I says, if wherever you're at, on your way to heaven or way to say goodbye to some people before you leave here, please be remembering me when I give this message so that I can definitely get through it. But the message I want to share with you this morning comes from uh, the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. When I was doing some time reading and had a couple weeks with mom in hospice, I had the opportunity to read through the book of Philippians. And uh, 
the pastor at our church is a slave driver. He made sure I got my devotionals in for, for this month. And uh, I'm sitting here trying to figure out what exactly to write about or what to say. And he's already given me the scriptures, but I chose to read through the book of Philippians. I thought, you know, that was always one of my mom's favorite books to read. In fact, in my library, she gave me a, a book. I think, Joe, you guys went through a study on Philippians. And uh, it's still one of my favorite um, commentaries on the book of Philippians. I'm going to share with you out of uh, Eugene Peterson's text, uh, the message. I want you to listen to these words because as I bring these words to you, it's almost as if I'm hearing my mom say to me, son, this is what I pray for you to be able to love this way. And it's my prayer, my desire, that as you go out and meet people, that you're passing on to them the influence of Christ. Because there's no greater impact that you're going to have in life than to impact someone with the love of Jesus Christ. And Mom was an example of that. So follow with me as I read, if you have your scriptures. Philippians chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. So this is my prayer, that your love will flourish and that you will not only love much, but well. Learn to love appropriately. You need to use your head and test your feelings so that your love is sincere and intelligent, not sentimental gush. Live a lover's life, circumspect and exemplary, a life Jesus would be proud of, bountiful in fruits from the soul, making Jesus Christ attractive to all getting everyone involved in the glory and praise of God. May God add the blessing to his word today. I entitled it, The Prayer to Love Extraordinarily. To have that kind of prayer life and love to make a difference in the world we live. So the question I put before you today is, do I love my way? Or have I learned to really love God's way? We're all on that journey in life as we grow in Christ to learn to love the way God loves us. And it's a tough challenge. It's not an easy thing. Life seems to throw stuff at us all the time that would move to take us away from really showing, reflecting the love of Christ. As we looked at this portion of scripture, some things come up. The first thing that we see here is a love that grows and flourishes. Does our love grow and flourish? Or have we come to a place where we have a love that's conditional? A love that says, I'm only going to go so far and love in such a way, but if you cross those lines, that's it. I'm not going there. I'm not going to do that. When I think of watching a love that glows and grows and flourishes, I think of my mom's green thumb, and she really had one. You know, one, in a little while, you'll get to see one of the pictures, and you'll see her just bloom and blossom as she sits in her garden. She had a little greenhouse back in, in Washington, planted everything from seed. And she used to actually tell me, she says, now I want you to look at this blossom open up. And it was F, she says, watch it, look at it, you can see it move. And I'm going, I don't got patience to watch it. It's like, move. But the other day with Rhonda, we were looking at a little flower on here, and I said, look at that, it looks like it's opening up. You can actually see it move a little bit and grow. And I thought about that. I thought about how in our life that we live, as love grows and flourishes, it becomes something very beautiful. And the more Christ-like it comes, the fragrance of that love and the beauty of that love is just incredible. And mom was the kind of person I can remember real well that it didn't take very long to be with her that you didn't sense the love of Christ in her. And she just had a way of, of, of just laying it right on the line. You know, it was just as common as breathing for her. Ephesians 3, 16 through 19 says, I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with the power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge. And the underlining score is that you may be filled with to the measure of all the fullness of God. You can tell when you're with people who have that fullness of God because it kind of just spills out on you. 
and you come from their presence and you come away from them and you feel like you've been in the presence of God in a way and touched by somebody in a way that only God can touch us through his love. In Philippians here, we see another question that's asked about loving well. Have we learned to really love well? Or has our love sometimes been inconsistent? You know, this was a hard thing for me because over the years I watched my mom in a lot of situations and a lot of things, a lot of difficult situations, in a time where I didn't expect her to really show love and grace, she did. Although I can remember two things real well as a little boy watching her lose her temper. This was before she came to know the Lord. We were doing ceramics one time, and I was about six years old, and I was about from here to that door across the room. There's a bunch of these tables, and they've got all this slip. You know what slip is? You pour this stuff into a mold, and you pull out the object first, and you've got to clean the seams off of it, and you know, you've got to take a wet sponge and meticulously clean off all the stuff. You got to get it ready to fire in a kill. So I'm watching her, and she's got these two big beer steins, these old German beer steins. And she's going to give them to one of the relatives, and she's going to paint on it. You know, she's going to, you know, once a bit, she's a great painter, you know, and she loves to do that. But I'm watching her, and we're in North Carolina. It's very humid in the summer. Of course, there's no air conditioner, there's fans. And I'm watching her work at this, and I'm watching the statue go in the heat. And the more she's trying to fix it, the more it starts to do that. And then finally, she just loses it. Bam, bam, with her fist, and she beats it down to a lump of clay like this. And I'm over here watching her like this. I can't believe this is coming out of my mother. And then she looks up and looks at me, and a big smile comes across her face. <laughs> I've never forgot that, you know. And there's a couple other times when she's lost it, you know. But I remember when she became a, a believer in Christ. No matter what the situation seemed to be, she seemed to always be consistent in how she related the love of Christ in every situation. What a great testimony to me. In 1 Corinthians 13, we get a very clear picture of what that is and consistent. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. And I really love this verse, verse 7. Always protects, always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. She was a great encouragement to me over the years. When things were difficult or I was down or wasn't sure what was going to happen next, she'd always say that no matter what happens, Jesus is always going to be with you now, where you're headed, and he's waiting for you when you get there. So know that you can move out in faith and confidence. Because God never changes. And that was always encouraging to me. Scripture also here talks about something very important to us. And that is that, uh, do we love appropriately? And I think loving appropriately is something that uh, the writer of Philippians wanted us to take a really good look at. Because so many things today are being done in the name of love that really aren't appropriate. Sometimes we're really challenged as Christians to put up and deal with a lot of stuff that's not appropriate as believers. I believe to some degree a love can be so wrong in the way that it enables other people to stay right where they're at and not change, not challenging them, not encouraging them to move forward and grow and become all that God has for them. To really love appropriately, when you don't, it really shows up in the lives of your children. It shows up in the lives of people that you know and, and other people. My mom had six sisters and she had a couple, three brothers. And I remember over the years watching some of my aunts raising their kids, but letting them get away with everything. Letting them, by love, just letting them be free to do and make whatever decisions they wanted she would live with whatever consequences they would be, those ands. And I watched through the course of their life that there was no doubt that she had a love for them, but the love wasn't appropriate. She didn't show the tough, strong love that was needed to guide and direct and help them to be people who could love 
and give that love in a way that builds and grows. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, we read, Now that you have purified yourself by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for your brothers, love one another deeply from the heart. That love deeply is so important. Sometimes it means loving in a way where we're not afraid to tell someone about the truth. But I remember something my mother told me about telling somebody the truth. She told me that one of the most important things when you tell somebody the truth, you've got to be with them and stick around long enough to help them to face the truth, find the truth, and live the truth. Unless you're willing to do that, don't confront them in truth. And I thought to myself, how appropriate, how true to love that way. One of the things that scripture teaches here in Philippians is a love that seeks the highest good for the one loved, not sentimental gush, not an emotional feeling of love that kind of is infatuated with whatever, but a love that makes a decision to love, a commitment that grows out of the covenant of God, the heart of God, to be able to love and stay true to that love no matter what. As a little boy, I can remember understanding what the love of God was the first time. And it's strange because it does have a connection with my mother. My parents had been separated for a year. Dad went to uh, Iceland, and when he got back, my mom and dad separated for a while, the first of a couple of times. But I remember she started in third grade to send me to Sunday school on a military base. And I had, I'd been to a couple of vacation Bible schools, and but not much with Sunday school. And I remember going to Sunday school and really excited about it, because it was at the elementary school that I was attending. And I went there and I heard about the love of God and I remember really trying to understand what the love of God was, you know. Um, and so anyway, I was on my way home and in North Carolina where we were at, they one of the most beautiful thing there is a dogwood tree. And you're probably familiar with what dogwoods look like. Beautiful trees. And it was a time of year they were in bloom. And I remember climbing in this tree and breaking off pieces I was going to take home a bouquet of those flowers to my mom. And I remember as I was breaking those off and putting, I was thinking about the love of God. And all of a sudden, I felt this welling inside of me, love for my mother. And then something beyond that touched me. I, I can't explain it to you, but it seemed like there was something beyond that love. And I said, that must be what the love of God is. And I remember taking those back to mom and how excited she was. But I never forgot that. It always has stuck with me that the love that she had shown me, the love that I had had for her, there was something beyond that that her love was pointing to. And that had to be the love of God that they were talking about. Romans 5.8 is one of my you know, favorite verses. It talks about God demonstrating his own love for us in this while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. When we think about a lover's expression, I've really come to this verse because we can either love people and express love like one lover does for another, fully devoted to them, or we can try to make that person an object of our own gratification. And we have to grow to the place as Christians where we have that passion expression of love toward God that beats for him continually. And rather than seeing God be a means of meeting my need or, or supplying what I want and being in a relationship where I love him for what he can do for me. And when I think about that, I think about Romans 5.8 a lot. Because it teaches me that the love of God is in such a way that that love comes to me and is demonstrated because Christ gave his own life for me. And he did this not when I got my life better, not when I got my life right or got everything worked through, but while I was still deep in my sin and had that impression, my desire was to be free from it. And as I came to him, I could grow in his love and grace and that he would teach me of the love that he showed me that was undeserved. 
The last question I have is that leads up to this question for us in, in closing. Do I love God's way or do I really love my way? In Philippians here, the last couple of verses, they give us a real clear picture of how to love God's way. God's way of loving is, first of all, bountiful. It's something that is always more than one would expect. You know, I, I was really touched at Alongside Ministries when I first went to work there. And someone asked me, they said, well, why did you, why did you see it as God's desire for you to go to work with ex-inmates? I said, because when I went and found out what this ministry was doing, they were being extravagant to the people who deserved it the least. And I said, I know God is there. I know that's where God's heart's at. Because you can see it working through the people as they do ministry and things there. And you can see this bountifulness that has been come, and you see the sense of giving out of an bounty that was coming in because of giving extravagantly to those who especially the world would say doesn't deserve it. Loving God's way, secondly, is attractive. It has a way of attracting people. And I, and I find this so true with my mom. There was something about my mom when people were with her for a short time. They felt attracted and they wanted to be with her again. Or when they saw her and they had built a relationship, they wanted to be reconnected and rebuild that and keep drawing from it. And I think that's true for us in loving God's way. Because we become attractive to people. People are looking to be affirmed and acknowledged and see the worth and value in who they are. And when we love them as Christ loves them, that's what we communicate to them. And they experience that affirmation. <clears throat> Thirdly, God's way of loving always invokes praise and glory to God. I think that's so important that we always acknowledge that the source of our love is not from us, but the love that God places in us and has provided for us to grow in through our relationship with Jesus Christ. And I think that's so important because then you really can acknowledge God and give glory to Him because you realize it's a resource and something that's so far greater than you. A few weeks at work, I work in a place where a young man has been married and divorced and struggled and just recently uh, have, has a gal that, that he's been living with and now they have a child and Boy, he's having to grow up, and he's really struggling with that idea and everything. And, and I talked to him about, I says, well, have you learned to love her for who she is rather than what she does for you? And he looked at me really funny. He says, no, how do, how do you learn to do that? He acknowledged in himself that she was more an object of her grat his gratification than really loving her as a person, that he had very difficult time doing that. And I said it only comes from God's love living and dwelling inside of you. Because until you have his personal love, you can't really love someone personally. It's always conditional, or always because, or always if they do something. So how does this apply to us today? Do we really love God for who he is? Or do we really only love him for what he does for us and what he can provide for us. You see, I had a conversation earlier today with someone that I love very much. And I shared with that person that one of the most important things is that we love God no matter what happens in this life. It's not a matter of living and claiming a promise or claiming health or, you know, what prosperity gospel or a name it and claim it or whatever that is or trying to hold God to all of his promises. The idea is to love him unconditionally, to love him for who he is, and to realize that no matter what comes to my life, whatever way it comes, persecution, suffering, good, bad, or whatever, it won't change the love I have for God and his love for me. Because when you love God that way, what a testimony you are to the world of the love of Jesus Christ. First Peter 1, 8 and 9 sums it up real well. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. 
For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. I've got some beautiful cards and emails and Facebook and all these things. But the card that stood out the most to me was the one that Paul and Angie sent us. It's a beautiful card, but it only had just a couple of words at the bottom of it. It said, her faith is now sight. Her faith is now sight. Everything that she's believed, everything that she's trusted in, everything that she's held in her heart, now she will fully express by sight. I can't wait to see her again. Let's pray. Father, it's so hard to really love the way that you would have us love as Christians. Sometimes it takes us a whole life and many, many experiences to get to a place where we love you just for who you are. But Lord, that's our heart's desire. We thank you for the examples of people that you put into our life that teach us that unconditional love, Jesus, that attract us to you and help us to better understand the love that you offer and the love that you have for us. Lord, for those of us who know you and have grown you, give us the strength each day to walk and live in a way that we reflect the attractiveness of your love. And Lord, I pray that through all of our actions and all of our expressions that we bring glory and praise to you. For we ask this in Jesus' name.
Lois Irene Sparrow died at Hospice of Arizona in Sun City, West Arizona on December 15th, 2013. She was born on December 20th, 1936 to Dexel Anton Sparrow and Victoria Ipoch in Kingston, North Carolina. She was preceded in death by her parents, six sisters and two brothers and her first husband, Joseph Medina Jr. Lois is survived by her husband, Joseph Wilson, of Sunset, Arizona, two sons, Douglas, Tim Harry, eight grandchildren, eight great-grandchildren, and multiple nieces and nephews. Lois was a seamstress extraordinaire, exceptional cook, and could make anything she planted grow. She worked as a hairdresser and put herself through nursing school, graduating as an LPN. She spent many long hours caring for senior patients, rehab, and serving several hospitals in Colorado, Washington, and Montana. Her greatest joy was serving others in church and participating in Bible fellowship for over 20 years. She always kept her promise and counted a great privilege to pray for others. She never knew a stranger, often inviting new people to a special dinner or working with others to prepare meals for those less fortunate. She did more than fixed meals. She offered her million dollar smile and gracious words from a heart filled with compassion. More than anything, she loved her husbands, both named Joe, and it was hard to tell at the, in the first place. In her heart really belonged her husband, Joe, or for her dog, Squeaky, a shih tzu given to her by her sister, Rita, known to everyone as Squeaky. Her greatest legacy is her unselfish love, which will always live through the lives of all her children, grandkids, and great grandkids. Kids. Now is a time of remembrance. If anyone has a memory or a story or time they'd like to share uh, about Lois, if you would please come up here one at a time uh, and share with everybody. Since I'm up here, I'll start. Um, I first met Lois about five years ago upon my release from prison uh, through Alongside Ministries. And um, one of the things I remember most about her um, was her smile and her love for the men. Um, it's tough when you come out because the world tells you no. You are an ex-offender. Um, you know, you know you spent your time in prison and you thought you've paid your penalty, but society reminds you that you haven't. So, to come out and just to have her smile, her love and her compassion. I loved uh, Sundays because that meant Lois was coming down and it was a home cooked meal <laughs> and it was great. Uh, and so that was my first, uh, first and greatest memories of her. I just absolutely just love her heart. Uh, I remember her warm hugs because it wasn't just a hug, it was a hug. My name is Doug Medina. Lois is my mother. And I just, for me, I remember the long back scratches uh, for minutes at a time, sometimes more than once a day. And it was just very interesting over her last 20 years that I could remember that she put a lot of other people first in her life and she loved people for who they were. And I admire that about my mom, and she'll be missed. I got to spend time in the Word with her through Bible study. That was precious, precious, because she loved Jesus so authentically, and everything about her witnessed his love. Children, 
um, Lois was just special. And, excuse me. In the way, I remember the Bible study uh, we used to talk about. And Rhonda and Lois and I used to go on Tuesday nights at the uh, Bird Trooper. We get that car loaded, and Rhonda, <laughs> get that wheelchair in the back of that trailer. And we had a breakdown on this morning once, and we had to stop, and we had people coming and trying to fix it. And Lois just said, she felt so bad. I said, it's going to be okay, Lois. But she went anyway, whether she could or not. Sometimes she took her oxygen, but she always was a true bitch. She was so loving. And we just enjoyed our Beth Moore Bible study, didn't we? And Lisa was there in the group, and I wouldn't trade that for nothing. The memories of, thank you. Okay, you guys, we're going to lift up the Lord. It is Christmas time. And our Lord Jesus Christ is our King of Kings and our Lord of Lords, and He's coming back someday to rule and reign. I love this song because it speaks of His birth, but really, joy in the world is about when He returns. And Mama Lois is already in His arms. I'm jealous.
and that's the goal that we should all ascribe to. And that's an incredible thing, and not everybody gets there. But it's obvious that it sounds that that's where she was her entire life. And that's a testimony to God's saving grace. And a lot of times for folks, they want to go the right direction, but they just don't know how to get there. And one thing that I'd like to do is just share a little scripture to help you if you don't know Christ is your Lord and Savior to help you get from here to there. Because we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of God's glory. But the good news is, Jesus is standing there. He's knocking at the door of our heart. And we just have to invite him in. And if we do, we get the gift of eternal life. We get to have a Savior who loves us, who cares about us. And in Romans 3, verses 21 through 25, it says, But now God has shown us a different way to heaven, not by being good enough and trying to keep his laws, but by a new way, though not new really, for the scriptures told about it long ago. Now God says he will accept us and acquit us, declare us not guilty, if we trust Jesus Christ to take away our sins. And we all can be saved in the same way by coming to Christ, no matter who we are or what we've been like. Yet all have sinned. All fall short of God's glorious ideal. Yet now God declares us not guilty of offending him if we trust in Jesus Christ, who in his kindness freely takes away our sins. For God sent Christ Jesus to take the punishment for our sins and to end all God's anger against us. He used Christ's blood in our faith as the means of saving us from his wrath. We're all fallen sinners. We've all fallen short. And I want to tell you that Jesus died for everybody. We're all equal in God's eyes. And if anybody here doesn't know Christ as their Savior, if you don't know what would happen if you died today, are you going to be with Jesus? We're all going to stand judgment. And if you can just picture that, standing in front of God and having to make an atonement for your life, and we've all sinned, and that relationship is broken. But if then if you can picture Jesus standing right there at the right hand of God, saying, he's one of mine, she's one of mine, I know them, they're good, the price has been paid. That's where Lois is. She knew Christ as her Savior, and he's standing there, ready to forgive her. And if there's anybody here who doesn't know that, don't leave here today if you don't. It's not some complicated thing. It's not about knowing all the right church words and knowing some formula. It's all about just admitting that we're a fallen sinner, that we need Christ in our lives, and that we want him to come in and be the Lord and Savior of our and I just ask everybody here, if you wouldn't mind just bowing our heads. And if there's anybody here today who would just say to me, Pastor, I want you to pray for me. I don't know Christ as my Lord and Savior, but I just want you to pray for me. I want to be forgiven. I want to know Christ as my Savior. I'm not going to ask you to do anything embarrassing. Just slip your hand up real quick and just say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to know Christ. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I want to lead us in the Lord's Prayer. And if everybody would just repeat it right alongside with me. Our Father.
Father God, we just thank you for Lois's life and for all the lives that she touched. I thank you for all the people here. And I just pray that her ministry of love to the fallen and broken, that it wouldn't end with her, that the seeds that she planted would continue to reap fruit for your kingdom for generations to come. I pray that you would give comfort to the family to her friends, that they would be able to rest in the knowledge that she is with you, that you are her Lord and Savior. And we want to thank you, Jesus, for the incredible sacrifice that you made for each and every one of us. I pray that you would go with us and just help us to spread your love to everybody who we come into contact with and fill us with your Holy Spirit. We ask all these things in the powerful, unchanging name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we would love to have everybody join us.